This is the Australian Synchrotron. It's a huge machine in Clayton, Melbourne. As you can see, it has a strange circular shape that's about 100 metres across. What the lines in this diagram represent are huge, complex metal tunnels. We'll soon see what the role of each part of the synchrotron is. But first, what does the synchrotron do? To know this, we'll need to remember our basic understanding of the chemistry of atoms. So, atoms contain a tiny nucleus, which makes up an infinitesimal part of an atom. Within this nucleus, there are two different types of subatomic particles, or hadrons. There are protons with a positive charge, and neutrons with no charge. The positive charge of the protons is balanced out by the negative charge of the electrons, which circle around the nucleus at almost the speed of light. Now let's look at these electrons in specific, because it is these that the Australian synchrotron predominantly deals with. Essentially, unlike protons and neutrons, electrons are considered elementary particles because they are unable to be broken down into further particles. Electrons, at times, may emit photons. These are the smallest packets of energy possible. These photons are emitted in the form of one pulse of light, or radiation. In other words, when forced to move in a certain way or at a certain speed, electrons can create energy. What the Australian synchrotron does is isolate an amount of electrons, accelerate them to huge speeds to create beams of high energy electrons, and then uses these beams to create a special form of light called synchrotron light. This light has many practical applications in biology, medicine, engineering, material science, and much more. So how does the synchrotron do such a task, working with particles that are too small to even see, let alone try and move? This segment of the synchrotron is where the process begins. This is the electron gun. What the electron gun does is use a process called thermionic emission to extract the electrons to begin with. It's a complicated process that essentially uses special heat to force electrons within an electrical conductor into a specific direction. The electron gun then begins accelerating these electrons until they have an energy of 90,000 electron volts, or 90 kilo electron volts. The electrons then pass into the linear accelerator, relatively short metal tunnel. This uses electromagnetic radiation in the form of radio frequencies to accelerate these electrons even further to the speed of 100 mega electron volts. At the end of the linear accelerator are a series of magnets which help to focus the beam of electrons. The electrons then pass into what is called the booster ring. The circumference of 130 meters, this is the smaller synchrotron ring seen here that does the rest of the accelerating work. It uses an electrical field to provide enough energy to boost the electrons up to 3 giga electron volts. Carefully arranged magnets on the edge of the boost ring keep the electron beam moving in the circular shape of the ring. Now that the electrons have reached top speed, they move into the storage ring with a circumference of 216 meters. As the name would suggest, this is where the electrons are stored, still at their top speed, so the synchrotron light can be extracted when it needs to be. The electron beam can typically stay running at that speed for about 20 hours. The, the storage ring can also make minor focusing and wavelength adjustments to the beam, before creating light out of what is known as synchrotron radiation. The electron beam that circulates through the storage ring constantly emits this synchrotron radiation. This is a largely uncontrollable thing. Electrons travelling at that speed, carrying that much energy, are going to release some of their energy in the form of synchrotron radiation, whether we like it or not. This isn't a bad thing though, this is how the Australian synchrotron works in the first place. When it is needed, the storage ring uses a very powerful magnetic field to convert the general synchrotron radiation into the specific type of synchrotron light needed. So while the electron beam remains in the storage ring, the synchrotron light it has emitted is directed down one of the many beam lines on the edge of the storage ring. This synchrotron light comes only in beams a few thousandths of a millimetre across, but they're extremely useful. At the end of these beam lines, there are end stations, in which the light is used for various practical purposes, which I'll cover in more depth soon. So what's the difference between normal light and synchrotron light? To explain it properly, I'll quickly cover some basic facts about electromagnetic radiation. Depending on the wavelength of the radiation, electromagnetic radiation can come in many forms. The only type that our eyes can see is visible light, and this comes in our familiar colours of the rainbow. When we talk about synchrotron light, 
We're not actually talking about light, it's just the visible light that we're used to. The Australian synchrotron's light can be created across almost all of the electromagnetic spectrum. The four most commonly used is X-rays, however, not exactly the same as the ones you usually use in a hospital. Because as well as ha potentially having a different electromagnetic wavelength, synchrotron light is much, much more powerful and brighter than normal. For example, the aforementioned synchrotron X-rays are hundreds of times more powerful than the type used in hospitals. So this is how the created synchrotron light is so useful in the end stations. Similar to how normal X-rays allow doctors to see the inner workings of our body, synchrotron X-rays, with their hugely increased power and accuracy, allow scientists to study the inside of much smaller things, such as cells, or even the inside of the tiny features of cells, with a lot more detail than before. For instance, scientists are now able to study the inner features and details of certain disease cells, such as viruses, on a much deeper level than before, and this brings us much closer to finding a way to cure these diseases. But medicine is just one area in which synchrotron light can help. With it, we can also study the structural nature of certain materials at the atomic level with extreme detail, and this is helping us develop far stronger and more efficient materials that are already in use in products across the globe. Harnessing synchrotron light is really a far more efficient and powerful way to study and examine the intricate nature of minute objects. It's as if we've only been able to look at objects through microscopes before with the lights off, and now we're finally able to turn them on to get a far better look at what we're doing. The Australian synchrotron is not alone. Across the world, many such synchrotrons exist, some less powerful, some more. A notable example is the famous Large Hadron Collider in Europe, which collides particles instead of simply harnessing energy with the aim more specifically directed towards getting a far deeper understanding of quantum physics and finding the much elusive Higgs boson. For our Australian synchrotron back home though, one thing is for sure, and that is that it's had a huge impact on the future of modern science in Australia and will continue to do so for many years to come.